this is lecture 13 of A2 metric spaces. In the last lecture, we introduced the notion of completeness of a metric space. And in this lecture, we're going to show that some key examples of metric spaces, specifically uh, the function spaces of bounded functions and also bounded continuous functions, are examples of complete metric spaces. Let's look first at the space of bounded functions on a set X. Let's just recall what it is. So x here is just an arbitrary set, and b of x is the normed vector space consisting of all bounded functions from x to the reals. And that has the subnorm or infinity norm placed upon it, defined to be the supremum over all little x in big X of the absolute value of f of x. And here's the theorem. For any set x, the space b of x of bounded functions on x is a complete metric space. Let's prove that theorem. Suppose we have a Cauchy sequence in this space B of X. So let that Cauchy sequence consist of functions Fn, n equals 1, 2, and so on. Then it's quite easy to see from the definition of Cauchy sequence and from the definition of the norm that for each fixed X, if I evaluate this sequence of functions Fn at the point X, that is then a Cauchy sequence of real numbers. So in the definition of Cauchy sequence, you can take the same value of big N um, that works for the sequence Fn for each of these individual sequences Fn of X. So I've got for each value of little x, I've got a Cauchy sequence of real numbers um, consisting of the values of Fn of X as N goes from 1, 2 and so on. Now the real numbers are complete and therefore each of those Cauchy sequences converges. And we'll call the limit of the sequence Fn of x, we'll call that f of x. So there is for each x a number f of x such that the limit as n tends to infinity of Fn of x equals f of x. So I claim that this f is a bounded function. To see why that's true, Let's look at the definition of Cauchy sequence, the fact that Fn is a Cauchy sequence. You'll take epsilon equals 1 in the definition of Cauchy sequence, and precisely what this tells you then is that there's a capital N, such that if little n and little m are greater than or equal to capital N, then the subnorm of Fn minus Fm is less than or equal to 1. That's precisely what it means for this sequence Fn to be Cauchy, um, for the value epsilon equals 1. In particular, taking little m to be capital N, what this tells you is that the absolute value of f big N of x minus f little n of x is less than or equal to 1 whenever little n is greater than or equal to big N. And that's uniformly for all little x in the set big X. So, I can take the limit as little n tends to infinity for each fixed x. And what that tells me, because f of x is the pointwise limit of the fn x's, well, that tells me that for every little x, uh, the absolute value of f big n x minus f of x is less than or equal to 1. Uh, but f big n is a bounded function. And I've shown now that this f differs from it by at most 1 everywhere, and so f is also a bounded function. So I've now shown that this sequence fn tends pointwise to a function f, which is a bounded function. I'm not quite finished because I need to show that in fact fn tends to f in the metric induced from the subnorm on this space b of x, whereas at the moment I've just shown pointwise convergence. So that's what we need to show. We need to show that fn tends to f in the subnorm. Well, let's show that. Let epsilon be greater than zero and apply the definition of Cauchy sequence once again. So now there is a capital N such that if little n and little m are greater than or equal to capital N, then uniformly in x, the absolute value of fn x minus fm x is less than or equal to epsilon. So that, once again, is just what it means for the sequence of functions fn 
to be Cauchy in the metric induced from the subnorm. Now fix a value of little n and a point x for each such fixed choice. I can take the limit as m tends to infinity. And because the limit as m tends to infinity of fm of x is equal to f of x, what this tells me is that the absolute value of fn of x minus f of x is less than or equal to epsilon. And that's uniformly for all x in the set big X, and that's for every value of little n greater than or equal to capital N. So in other words, for every little n greater than or equal to capital N, the subnorm of fn minus f is less than or equal to epsilon. And epsilon here was arbitrary, and so this is exactly what it means for fn to tend to f in the subnorm. And that concludes the proof. So I had a Cauchy sequence of functions fn, bounded functions fn. I identified a candidate f for the limit function by looking pointwise. And then I needed to show that that f was bounded. And then finally, I needed to show that indeed fn tends to f in the metric. Let's turn now to a discussion of continuous functions. So now, to even make sense of what is meant by a continuous function, we need x not to be just a set, but to be a metric space. And we'll also just be looking at the bounded continuous function. So this is the space that we denote by c sub b of x. And the reason for that is that we now have the subnorm available to us. So remember that if x is a metric space, then c sub b of x denotes the normed vector space of bounded continuous functions f from x to r with the subnorm. And the theorem is that this is a complete metric space. Let's have a look at the proof of that. Well, the bounded continuous functions are a subspace of the bounded functions. And therefore, by result we established in the last lecture, it's enough to show that the bounded continuous functions are a closed subspace of the space of bounded functions because we've just shown that the space of bounded functions is complete. Um, and in the last lecture, we showed that a subspace of a complete metric space is itself complete if and only if it's closed. So we need to show that the space of bounded continuous functions is a closed subset of the space of all bounded functions. And to do that, we'll show that it's closed undertaking limits. So if you have a convergent sequence of functions in the space c sub b of x of bounded continuous functions, then its limit is also a bounded continuous function. And I showed in a previous lecture that that is one possible characterization of what it means to be closed. So being closed under, under limits is an equivalent form of being closed. So let me take a sequence fn, n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on, of bounded continuous functions on x, and suppose that they tend to a limit uh, in the subnorm, in the metric induced from the subnorm. Let's call that limit f, and so f will be some bounded function on x. And I want to show that in fact, f is a bounded continuous function on x. Well, let's uh, pick a point A in big X. I'm going to show that f is continuous at a. So let epsilon be greater than zero. Now by the assumption that fn tends to f in the subnorm, there is a value of little n such that the subnorm of fn minus f is less than or equal to epsilon over three. That's just an application of the definition of limit. That's what it means for fn to tend to f in the subnorm. So fix a value of n with that property. Now, fn is a continuous function, and so it's certainly continuous at a. And if I apply the definition of continuity with epsilon over 3 in place of epsilon, I get the following. There's a positive delta, such that if the distance from x to a is less than delta, in other words, if x lies in the ball of radius delta about a, then the distance from fn of x to fn of a is less than epsilon over 3. 
But then if x lies in this ball of radius delta about a, we have the following little chain of inequalities. Now, the distance from f of x to f of a by the triangle inequality is bounded above by the sum of the distance from f of x to fn of x plus the distance from fn of x to fn of a plus the distance from fn of a to f of a. And that each of those three terms there is less than epsilon over three by what I've just said. And the sum of three epsilon over threes is epsilon. So what I've shown is that if the distance from x to a is less than delta, then the distance from f of x to f of a is less than epsilon, which of course is exactly what it means for f to be continuous at a. So it follows that indeed f is continuous at a. Since a was an arbitrary point, f is in fact a continuous function everywhere. And it's definitely a bounded function. We already know that. So it's a bounded continuous function. And that concludes the proof. So, in fact, what we've shown here is really the fact that a uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous. So I think this is a fact that you've seen before in the context of functions on the real line. So the fact that fn tends to f in the subnorm is precisely the statement that fn converges to f uniformly. The fn are continuous and therefore f is continuous. So it's the same what I'd call epsilon over three argument uh, that, that one sees in this context. This is lecture 14 of A2 metric spaces, the last lecture pertaining to chapter six of the course. And in this lecture, we're going to look at a nice topic connected with complete metric spaces, and that's called the contraction mapping theorem. And that theorem has links uh, to the differential equations course, actually. It'll be mentioned again and used, in fact, in that course. Then at the very end of the lecture, I will make some non-examinable remarks on the idea of what's called a completion. So let's turn first then to the contraction mapping theorem. Well, before stating the contraction mapping theorem, we need to know what is meant by a contraction. And here's the definition of a contraction. Let X be a metric space and suppose that F is a map from X to itself. Then it's said to be a contraction if there is a constant K strictly less than one, such that the distance between F of X and F of Y is less than or equal to K times the distance between X and Y for all little x and little y in big X. So F moves points closer together by at least this fixed amount k that's strictly less than one. It's a very easy exercise to show that every contraction is a continuous map. You can in fact take delta to equal to epsilon everywhere. So it's a uniformly continuous map. And what really must be emphasized is that contraction does not say just that the distance from f of x to f of y is less than the distance from x to y. There really needs to be this constant k less than one, such that the distance from f of x to f of y is less than or equal to k times the distance from x to y. And this is a strictly stronger thing. We'll see an example on the next slide to show that that's a strictly stronger notion than just that f moves points strictly closer together. So that's the definition of a contraction. What's the contraction mapping theorem? Well, it states the following. Suppose I have a non-empty complete metric space X. And suppose that F from X to X is a contraction as defined on the previous slide. Then F has a unique fixed point. So in other words, there's a unique little X in big X such that F of X equals X. Before turning to the proof, let's make a few remarks on this. So I mentioned on the last slide that the notion of contraction is not just that F moves points strictly closer together. So it's, we can think about this weaker condition that the distance from F of X to F of Y is strictly less than the distance from X to Y whenever X is distinct from Y. And with only that weaker condition, such a theorem as this one does not hold. And here's an example. So consider the space X, which is closed one up to infinity on the real line. So that's a non-empty complete metric space. And then I can consider the map F of X equals X plus one over X. So I'll leave you 
To prove that this satisfies the condition that f moves points closer together, but I think it's pretty obvious that this has no fixed points. I mean, the equation f of x equals x has no solutions. And you can check that this f is, is not a contraction. So it's also an example of a function which satisfies, which moves points closer together, but is not quite a contraction. So that's an important example to bear in mind. Um, it's also important that x is a complete metric space, otherwise this theorem will fail. For instance, if I take the open interval 0, 1, which is not complete, um, and the map f of x equals x over 2, well, that's then certainly a contraction, but it has no fixed point in that space. So that's the contraction mapping theorem. Now, the proof of this is quite fun. Well, we'll begin with the easy part, which is showing that a fixed point, if there is one, is unique. So there can't be two fixed points. Well, suppose that there were two fixed points, f of x1 equals x1 and f of x2 equals x2. Then the distance between x1 and x2, well, that's the same as the distance between f of x1 and f of x2, because f of x1 equals x1 and f of x2 equals x2, which by the contraction property is at most k times the distance from x1 to x2. But distances are non-negative and, and k is strictly less than 1. So the only way this could possibly happen is if the distance from x1 to x2 is 0. Or in other words, that x1 equals x2. So there can't possibly be two fixed points of a contraction f. Now let's look at how to show that there is one fixed point, which is the more interesting direction of the proof. And here's the key idea. Pick an arbitrary point to start with, call it x0, and just follow what happens to x0 under repeated applications of f. So apply f to x0 to get x1, apply f again to get x2, apply f again to get x3, and so on. It doesn't matter which x0 we start with. And I claim that this sequence of xn's converges to a limit x, and that that x is a fixed point of f. So it's a nice idea. And the other thing about it is it's actually algorithmic. Um, so this in a situation where you actually were given a contraction, this would let you computationally find the fixed point just by iterating an arbitrary starting point. So that's the key idea. Well, now let's turn to the details. So we form that sequence of iterates. And we want to show that this sequence xn of iterates converges to a limit x. Now we're in a complete metric space, and so one way of showing that a sequence converges to a limit is to show that it's a Cauchy sequence. But that's equivalent. So we will show that this sequence xn is Cauchy. Well, let's first of all compute what the distance between xn and xn minus 1 is. And to do this, we'll use the contraction property repeatedly. So the distance from xn to xn minus 1 is at most k times the distance from xn minus 1 to xn minus 2. So why is that? That's because xn is f of xn minus 1, and xn minus 1 is f of xn minus 2. Then applying this principle again, this in turn is less than or equal to k squared times the distance from xn minus 2 to xn minus 3. And I can just keep going like that until eventually I'll get all of these are less than or equal to k to the n minus 1 times the distance from x0 to x1. So by repeated applications of the contraction property and the definition of this sequence xn, I come out with the statement that the distance from xn to xn minus 1 is less than or equal to k to the n minus 1 times the distance from x0 to x1. And this inequality turns out to be enough to show that the sequence xn is Cauchy. So let's look at the details of that now. So let's uh, assume that little n is bigger than, is strictly greater than little m. And I want to give an upper bound for the distance between x little m and x little n. So that's the sort of thing I need to do to show that something's a Cauchy sequence. So here is uh, a list of inequalities. Let me talk through them. <coughs> 
the, the distance between xn and xm, well, first of all, let me apply the triangle inequality. So I shall move from xm to xn in stages. I'll go first to xm plus 1, then to xm plus 2, and so on. So applying the triangle inequality, I get that the distance from xm to xn is bounded by the distance from xn to xn minus 1, plus the distance from xn minus 1 to xn minus 2, and so on, down to the distance between xm plus 1 and xm. Now I can apply the inequality that, that I established at the very top of the slide to all of those terms. So the first term is bounded by k to the n minus 1 times the distance from x0 to x1. The second term by k to the n minus 2 times the distance from x0 to x1. And then the final term, so the distance from xm to xm plus 1, is bounded by k to the m times the distance from x0 to x1. So I get a sum here, and that sum is a, a portion of a geometric progression. And if I take out the factor of k to the m, well, I then get 1 plus k plus k squared and so on. And I'll just take the sum off to infinity. I won't even bother to finish it at um, k to the m minus m minus 1. So all of this is bounded by k to the m times the sum of the geometric series, 1 plus k plus k squared plus dot dot times the distance from x0 to x1. And that geometric series has a finite sum, 1 over 1 minus k. And what I've shown then is that the distance from xn to xm is bounded by a constant c times k to the m. And this is for all little n strictly bigger than little m. Where the constant c is, if I want to be explicit, the distance from x0 to x1 divided by 1 minus k. So crucial here, of course, that k is strictly less than 1. If k was equal to 1, I wouldn't be able to sum that geometric series. So this is where I've crucially used that k is strictly less than 1. But this shows that the sequence xn is Cauchy, because this, um, this upper bound I've got here, this constant c times k to the m, very rapidly tends to 0 as m tends to infinity. So if I choose capital N large enough, um, I can make that quantity less than epsilon. And that, again, uses the fact that K is less than 1. So I've shown that for an arbitrary epsilon greater than 0, there's a capital N such that, provided little n and little m are bigger than or equal to capital N, then the distance between Xn and Xm is less than epsilon. So we have a Cauchy sequence. Well, that's great because we're in a complete metric space. And so if we have a Cauchy sequence Xn, well, then it converges. So suppose Xn converges to a point X. And then I claim that that X is indeed a fixed point of the map F. And that's all I need to do to finish the proof. Well, that's not too difficult because F is continuous. I already remarked that every contraction is continuous. And therefore, I can compute f of x. So f preserves limits. So x is the limit of the xn's. Therefore, f of x is the limit of the f of xn's. But by definition, f of xn is xn plus 1. And so the limit of the f of xn's is the limit of the xn plus 1's, which of course is the same as the limit of the xn's, which is x. So f of x is indeed equal to x. And that finishes the proof. So that's a very attractive theorem called the contraction mapping theorem with quite a fun proof. Now, that's the end of the examinable part of this lecture um, and, and indeed chapter. Um, just to finish, though, I want to talk about a, a non-examinable topic briefly, which is the idea of a completion. What's the idea of completion? Well, metric spaces may not be complete. So an arbitrary metric space X doesn't have to be complete. But it turns out that there's a way of forming its completion, which we'll call x tilde. And very, very informally speaking, you get x tilde by just sort of throwing in all the limits of Cauchy sequences. OK, so that's uh, that's not the definition of x tilde. Let's look a little bit more precisely. So the actual definition of x tilde is that it consists of all Cauchy sequences modulo a certain equivalence relation. And we say that two Cauchy sequences are equivalent. Well, basically, if it looks towards that, if, if it looks like they should be tending towards the same limit.
So the definition is that two Cauchy sequences are equivalent if I call those sequences xn and x primed n. They're equivalent if and only if xn minus x primed n tends to zero as n tends to infinity. So one can use the closed bracket notation for equivalence class. So write closed brackets of xn from n equals 1 to infinity to be the equivalence class of the sequence xn n equals 1 to infinity. So those are the elements of the space x tilde. And then you can define a distance d tilde on that space x tilde in the following manner. So the distance between two equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences is the limit as n tends to infinity of the distance from xn to xn prime. Now already there's something quite non-trivial to check here that this is even well defined. So I need to check that this is independent of which particular representative of each equivalence class I chose. But I'm not going to go into proofs in this section. It turns out that is the case. And it also turns out that uh, this is a distance, so it satisfies the symmetry property and the triangle inequality. More than that, you can prove that this space X tilde is a complete metric space and that there is a natural embedding of X into it, uh, essentially given by mapping the point little x in big X to the constant sequence consisting of just X. And that map is continuous injective map with dense image. So we have this nice picture that there is a construction where even though an arbitrary space X might not be complete, you can form its completion X tilde and X is dense in its own completion by somehow sort of throwing in all Cauchy sequences, the limits of all Cauchy sequences. OK, just to finish, I want to give a couple of examples. So the completion of the rationals with respect to the usual metric is the reals. Now, there's an interesting point here, which is, so can one define the reals as the completion of the rationals? So the, the answer to that is sort of yes, but you have to be a bit careful, because in all of the course so far in developing the theory of metric spaces, I've tacitly assumed that I have access to the real numbers. So the better answer to this is that you can define the reals via a construction that's sort of basically this an entirely analogous, very similar construction of completion. Um, and maybe one should do that right at the very beginning if you want to be totally rigorous. So you first of all define the reals using a completion construction like the one on the previous slide. And then sort of separately later on in the course, well, when you come to the non-examinable part of the course, you then do the notion of completion of a metric space separately. So there are some slight circularity issues here to do with the fact that uh, I've used the notion of real numbers throughout the course when talking about metric spaces. Anyway, the real numbers are the completion of the rationals. Now, another example that's very important in number theory is the completion of the rationals with respect to the piadic metric. Um, I'll only mention this very briefly. I didn't even quite define, I only talked about the two adic metric. Um, the definition of the p adic metric is quite similar, but I also only defined it on the integers z, not on the rationals q. Nonetheless, there's a way of defining a p adic metric on the rationals q. And the completion of that is what's called uh, the p adic rationals qp. And this is a fundamental object in, in number theory. Um, so that is completions, not examinable, but hopefully of some interest to some of you. And that's the end of chapter six of the course.